So if you don't know me, I'm Scott Peterson. I'm co-owner of the Gear Page. Um, I uh, used to be a tube amp fanatic. Uh, it, when I started uh, looking at modeling and stuff like that as a solution, kind of look around, see what was out there. I was using a bunch of Line 6. I had tried Digitech, tried all the, the stuff out there. I heard about this crazy box in 2007, beginning in 2007. People started talking about this fractal box. And uh, at that time, there was no Ultra, there were no forums. Um, there were just posts here and there about this uber high-end box that is the end-all, be-all for modeling. So I got in contact with a couple guys that actually owned it, got on the phone, spent a couple hours asking a bunch of questions, uh, and ordered this box, took a flyer on this box, this crazy expensive box. It's got to be really good, right? I got, the, I got it in the spring of 2007. I was going through the factory presets, and I hit the first one, uh, EVH um, eruption. And it was this clarity on the high end that I never heard out of a modeler. I knew right then, this is this box, nice. This is this is going to work for me. So beyond that, and then I wrote a little review, and um, and then it just kind of went from there. So all it is is it's a great box. It's a box I like to play. I like to talk about it, so I post a lot. And th in the end, that's really what it's all about. So when we talk about taming the monster, um, it's not really a monster. It's just a box. Um, but a lot of people attribute magic and it's got these parameters don't understand it It's this massive incredible thing. It's really not if you approach it with a plan It's pretty simple to get what you want And so you have to do is basically simplify everything. It's not complicated You're gonna hear me use the word simple a lot and you're gonna hear me basically Look at things methodically and get it together So it's pretty simple to do if you have a plan going in and know what you want to do um, if you don't it can get pretty complicated so what, why, and how, do, why, why do we need a plan? What's, what's the big deal with a plan? Basically, it's method, not magic. There's no magic parameter. There's no magic IR. There's no magic preset that's going to set everything on fire and blow you away. And This is the kind of box where it allows you to go in and personalize what you want out of it. A lot of people will say, well, it doesn't sound like a tube amp, or it's, not, it's digital, or it's this and that. It's far beyond all that. What you can do with this box is get in and not only make it sound like an amp, make it sound like your amp. You can personalize it. You make it unique. Um, you make it your amp sound. It's you. It's not going and shopping for 50 presets and finding one you kind of like and changing some things and rocking it out and playing something everybody else is playing. You make your own. When you get this box, it's so practical because you can put it in so many different configurations, so many different rigs. So a lot of guys can get confused or they get mixed up because they, they'll get it and they'll just start twiddling knobs and they don't think about what they were going to put it out, put through. They didn't think, oh, where you need to have a plan with this box. So if you get the box, are you going to run it conventional? Are you going to run it as a, a glorified preamp uh, with a power amp and a conventional cab? Works phenomenal that way. Uh, are you going to use it for recording and go direct into your DAW and listen on your studio monitors? Are you going to take it out live? Do you want a powered monitor of some sort to hear yourself? Um, do you want to run conventional? Do you want to do a hybrid where you're sending out the front of house and you're listening to yourself on stage through your power amp and cab? You can do all those things. Um, so what you need to do though before you get anywhere is plan what you want to do with it. And what I'll talk to people about is um, when you get into the box, look at the stock presets, check them out, go for it. Th there's a lot in the box now. I like the first 40 or so presets because they're pretty basic straight up set up for direct front of house. You can hear it. You can put that into studio monitors. You can put it into a power monitor. And assuming it's pretty accurate to the source, you're going to get out what you want. Um, it's pretty easy to tweak. And that's a template that's pretty simplified. Most guitarists understand it. Um, the other way that you can do it now, Cliff added in a little tweak where you can have tone matches. So you basically, you can shortcut what you want to do. So if you get into the box and you're not a big dialer and you don't like downloading presets and you don't like the stock presets, now you can shortcut it. Grab a great recording of a great tone, you know, great tone that you really want to emulate, and boom, tone match it. It's instant. It's very quick, very fast, and you're going to see a lot of people talking later on about all that stuff in depth. I'm not going to go there with that. But what I'm going to talk about is building your own. That's the way I like to work because I know what I like. I've owned a lot of amps. I know what amps I like. I know how I like those amps to sound. I've got recordings of myself playing with those amps. I can always back check what I'm designing in the box against those. And now if I wanted to, I could just tone match them, but that's too easy, so I don't want to do that. Some of the basics we're going to talk about real quick are, are for a lot of guys, it's real, really, really easy stuff. But for other guys, it's not. So I'm going to go over the front of this thing, and we're going to take a look. They're going to zoom in. I don't know if you can see it anywhere, if they can put it up on, the, on that feed. 
But basically, the first thing that I like to tell people to do is when you first get the box, the first thing you're going to want to do is go to your, your I.O. button and get your AD input levels. This is not your gain into your amps or your signal chain. That's not what this is. This is sets your signal to noise with the AD converters. So when you hear these guys talking about tickling the red and all that kind of stuff, what does that mean? That's all I'll do. If I see that hitting those reds, I'm there. I just set it. If it's too low, we want to have a zero, man. It's not getting there. Just turn it up till you get it. And if it's hitting the red and holding it, you're done. So that much is done. Easy. The next thing I usually do is I have them go over to the audio tab and make sure you got all this right. What is your input? You know, I'm coming auto analog in into the front. I'm um, running left on left only. My output one is stereo. And then there's some other things you can configure, but right now it's set. It's done. When you go to your global settings then, that's the third part that I'll go into. If you're going to run direct to front of house, or, your, or FRFR if you want to call it, just make sure that your power amp modeling is on and your cabinet modeling is on. That's pretty much it. I like to have spillover on, on everything, so I'll turn that on both, which is reverb and delay. And then you're ready to get into the box and start making some noise, and it's cool. So what I like to do when I have guys work on trying to make their own presets for the first time is just basically approach it. Don't try and throw in big effects chains. Don't try to throw in big delays. That stuff's confusing. Let's break it down. Let's just get an amp, a cab, and a reverb. And a lot of people ask me, why do you need reverb? Um, when you're running direct to front of house, one of the things that are key is the sense of space. When you're just playing it out through a PA, it does not sound like amp in the room, and you guys have heard all over read those arguments for years and years. What I like to do is think of it as an amp in space just in your perception. If you don't have reverb and you're just playing it dry, it will always sound flat. To me, it just doesn't have a depth. You don't need a ton of reverb. You just need a touch of it to give you some sense of space. So what I'll do, now this is just a stock preset. I'm going to look at the, re the reverb, and I'm going to edit it. And all I do is just look at it real quick. I got a medium room. It's, serial, it's, it's in serial mode, so the amount of input gain is going to be there, and then your mix is going to determine how much reverb you've got. Pretty simple, 11%. That's a little high for me. When it's this way, I'll go more like for eight. Analog, not digital. So all I'm listening for is not the tone right now. I just want to hear some kind of pop on the end of it so there's depth to that cab. So when I, it's not about tone, it's about sense of space. So reverb's simple. Um, routing, I like to talk sometimes about doing serial versus parallel. Um, I like parallel. It's simpler for me because you're just adding to the signal. You're adding some reverb to it. In serial, you're adding a mix of how much is wet, how much is dry. So sometimes there's level issues if you're bypassing it on your foot switch when you're in serial, if you're not paying attention to where your levels are and you're in serial. So to me, it's just simplified that way, but that's the way that I came up running you know, rack processors and stuff like that to keep it easy. The most important block, in my opinion, and this will be counter to what you're going to probably read a lot on the internet, when you're running direct to front of house is the cab block. It sets everything. It sets the character of your tone. It sets the, um, the color of your tone and the timbre of your tone. And by that, what I mean is it is the filter that everything else comes through. That speaker is essential. The XFX comes with a ton of stock cabinets. They're phenomenal. Uh, we'll show a real quick way of how to do a real quick mix to get different timbres, different colors mixed together and get that out of the box real fast, real easy, setting with different mics. And then the third part is with user IRs. Now you can load them in. There's a lot of third-party guys out there doing that. Um, there's freebie stuff. There's uh, the red wire everybody knows about, Own Hammer. There's, uh, you know, a, there's a ton of guys out there doing that stuff now. I prefer to stick to the own hammer and the red wires um, simply because I know they work, and most other guys don't have a problem working with them either. What I'll do when I go into the cab block is, in essence, I just default everything out. I take the uh, room out, 
I make sure the proximity is normal. This is the factory one. So I just take this to five. So I've got no room. I don't want any motor drive. I don't want any air. I don't want any of that. If you want to mess with that, do it after. Don't do it before. Just listen to it and see what you've got first. So this cab is set up right now from the factory with double verb, the D and the C mixed together in a stereo configuration. What I like to do when I mix these is instead of treating it as a stereo cab, I'm going to pan them center. That way, no matter what I've got, it's going to come out as one singular tone. I don't want it spread in the stereo signal because sometimes that can fool your ear. So if I hear it, and this is the straight up, that's the factory default, and it sounds pretty good. On a Fender Twin, on a, with a PRS. That's not my sound, so what do I gotta do? So we already talked about the simple blocking. The amp block, everybody's favorite. Again, keep it simple. The method that I approach this amp block, if people do this, you can make any amp block works for you. Now, one other thing that I wanted to talk about and I didn't on the cab is what cab works for what amp. On the AxeFX Wiki, uh, Yek, who deserves a huge shout out for what he's done, you can go in there, look any amp type up that's in this box. And any amp type that Cliff adds to the box, you can go find it. And then you can use Google past that if you're starting to use stuff that isn't in the box because you're using tone matching. Find out what sorts of speakers work with, the, with that kind of a sound. Start there. Keep it simple. Um, so past that, and I just really wanted to give a shout to Yak because he really deserves it. That guy does a ton of work. The first thing that I do is I'll come into an amp block. We're going to do the really scary thing where we default it out. Actually, I want to default out the amp block. I default it out. So right now I've got absolutely everything up at five. It's all, what I'll do is I start with the level. To give myself enough headroom, I, al I always start, for some reason, at about minus 10. What, the reason I do that is because of most of my output stuff that I've noticed in front of house over the years, I want this around noon when I go direct front of house. If I start at about minus 10 on my clean sounds here, I've got the headroom to push if I need it for boosts. And I never, ever, ever hit the red on, for the guys in front of house. They never yell at me anymore. And it's just, it's just a real good rule of thumb. It works. And then when you're matching your other sounds to it, your dirty sounds, it's a lot easier, too, to sometimes get that level right. Now, again, what I, when I start putting this kind of stuff up, these are not rules. They're guidelines. But they're good starting places. Um, most guys that have been around for a while already know this. It's pretty simple. Um, on non-master amps, basically you start at a nine. So on a Fender Twin, I basically want to crank that master up. So it defaults up five, I'm gonna just take it to nine. Cliff added a boost in anything over nine, so you can get more if that's what you're looking for. And then what I normally do, we'll come over here to the drive, and I take it down to zero. And I don't care what amp it is, I don't care if you're going for a Mesa Dual, Recto, Crazy Crunch, Diesel, whatever, doesn't matter. Start it at zero, use your ears. Now everybody hears me say that thing, use your ears, you know, well, how do you do that? Well, if you can't use your ears, maybe you shouldn't be playing guitar. That's sort of what I want to say, but if I ever do say that, I get yelled at, so I won't. So then basically, now I've got to, I've got to hum, do a humbucker. I'm not going to do the split stuff. I'm just going to go and just basically a neck, neck humbucker kind of a setup. Bring it up. I know it on this guitar, at least on mine, I usually end up around two. Sounds pretty good. So quite honestly, in this amp, what I've found is I don't really even anymore touch any of the other controls because I don't need to. But what I would go to from here is go over and then look at my bass, middle, treble, and presence and start turning them. And when I adjust them, I do a real simple method. I just pick one, and in essence, if I start with the bass, for instance, try it, five. Try to four. That's not that, I don't like that. Try to six. That's too much. Well, then I want it around five. 
That was it. And I'll do that for every one of the controls. Done. I usually will decide on a lot of amps if I like the bright on, the bright off, versus using the presence cranked up or down. And it matters if you do it at volume. Um, when you crank it up, sort of like Mark was playing earlier, if he plays that stuff real quiet, it's not going to sound the same. It won't, have, it won't react the same. When you do this kind of a thing, you need to have the volume up how loud you're going to actually use them. If you do that, then you're going to end up with accurate stuff for what your tastes are. The last one that I'm going to talk about is my new favorite control, and that's the input trim. And uh, that thing's been absolutely golden. You can take that now. Now that is where the two really separates from what the Ultra can do. Because now I can go in per preset, and even when you get into the XYs, when you get into different versions of, said, say, the said, same amp and the same preset, or some other things that are coming up with scenes, which are going to be pretty cool, you'll hear about later, um, you can dial in different amounts of trim going into that amp. So if you like a little bit of a hotter signal, and I'm not going to on the on this because I'm playing with humbuckers, but it's the second one down. Basically just grab it and play. And so what you can do is you can juice the front of that amp. So in, your, in essence, you can set how much gain comes into that amp. You don't need to use drive pedal. You can. You can use drive. You can set up PEQs. You can set up filters. You, know, you don't have to. You do it here, and you can set the amount of clean boost you want coming into that amp to give that amp that juice and the pop that what you want makes it feel right to you, and you're done. And that's pretty much it. Once I do this, normally, I have an amp sound that I like. And that's the whole, that's it. Now guys will go, well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We, we got all these parameters, man. The, the magic one's in there, and you haven't touched it or nothing. And I say, wait a minute, play your guitar again. Well, yeah, that's great, but it, there's got to be something in there that makes it even better. And I say, at some juncture, and it, painters run into this, artists of any stripe whatsoever, at some point, you got to walk away and just say, it's done. If it sounds good and it feels good, you're done. That's it. It's the whole story. And that's the simplify way of doing that. Uh, one of the things I do want to talk about since we're here, I'm going to see if I can get this to work here. So basically what we're going to do is I'm just going to plug that in. And what I'm going to do is then I'm going to switch around in the different IRs because I think it's important enough for people to hear. And even if I don't dial in a Marshall or a Bogner or anything else, you'll get the understanding based on that. Uh, maybe I'll dial in a Marshall real quick because it's pretty quick because everybody likes JCM 800s, right? So we can dial it in. Can we send over those three? Um, the one in particular that I need to send over from this is a, uh, it says 212 Shiva 12N. It's a cab IR. So I'm going to use AxeEdit and AxeManage here to import some uh, user cab IRs for Scott. And we're going to do a presentation later on what those are, how they're created, what that means. And actually, we had intended to have this all done ahead of time as preparation for the show. But as things got tight, I said, you know what? Let's let people take a look at this process, too. I get a lot of questions about how do I use Axe Manage to bring an impulse response file into the Axe Effects. And it's, it's really quite simple. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to talk you through the process of getting some files, which Scott put into my Dropbox. And I'm going to import those to the Axe Effects, and then he'll dial them in in a preset. So the first thing I'm going to do in, in Axe Edit, if I were to back up a step, was to click on this Axe Manage button. You see that in the upper left-hand corner there beneath the logo. And that loads the companion program to Axe Edit. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Axe Manage yet, it should look pretty familiar. It's based on a file explorer, Windows Explorer or Mac Find or something like that. It's got this tree structure on the left and a view window on the right. And over on the left here, we can see the major nodes of this tree are the Axe Effects itself, where I see banks of presets and user cabs, some special folders on the hard drive dedicated to Axe Edit, some utilities, things like backups, snapshots, and our entire computer. So I'm going to go the long way around into my hard drive, into my user folder, because I've got to get to my Dropbox. And Dropbox is not integrated with this program. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open the user folder, 
I'm going to go into the Dropbox, and I'm going to go into the XFest folder. And Scott, where will I find those User in the Dropbox? User IRs should be a folder. IRs? IRs, yep. So now I've, I've browsed to the location where Scott sent me these files. So what do I do with them? Okay, now's where I'm going to demonstrate something that I think is really important to this process. And I'll tell you actually, just, just a quick aside for those of you who are familiar with Axe Manage, it was my original vision for the way this program should work, that there should be a little menu at the top designed to support common activities. Set this thing up for me to do this cab process. Set this thing up for me to back up my Axe Effects. And we're working on that. It's going to be a drop-down menu which saves a certain type of a view. So right now what I'm going to do is create a view that shows us the Axe Effects on one side of the screen and the files of the computer on the other side of the screen. But I also want to let you know that there's a plan to make that whole process be one click. So the way to do that is to create a new view. So I'm going to right click on user cabs and I'm going to choose new view here. And you see now what happened. I have the original Axe Edit view and I've right clicked on user cabs. I've got something over here now that says Axe Effects user cabs. It's a new view. So Scott, which cab do you want me to bring in uh, first? Put the P12. You drop all three over there, but put P12 over there right P12. now. It says Shiva P12 or some, something like that. Um, I see it. It says Own Hammer 212 Shiva 12N MA200 F1L. That's the one. Woo! And I'm going to just drag it and drop it yep. into slot one. Okay. And now I'm going to take what? The Bogner? Mm, you could either. Yeah, to put the mar I'll do a Marshall real quick up to. Okay. So the first talking. one, 412 G65. Yeah. That drop one. that in number two. Yep. You notice as I drop them in the right-hand screen, the icon is turning red. That lets me know that Axe Manage is seeing my changes, but that we haven't saved them or sent them to the Axe Effects yet. Red is the icon indicating that you need to take further action. It's a warning that you haven't saved them. So let's now take the Owen Hammer 412 and drag that in there to slot three. Right? From here, it's very simple. I go to the File menu, Send to Axe Effects. And I don't need to send all 50 here so you can watch a progress bar. I'm going to say Changes Only. Changes Only. And they'll turn green as they go in. So those three cabs are now loaded into the Axe Effects. And you can see if there were already pre-existing cabs, their names appear in gray in this area so that you know what you're overriding. Right, and the other thing is this are. is sort of, it's a librarian too. It keeps the file name on. It tells you what file name it is on the Axe Effects. You can go ahead and figure, you know what you got in there. It's not a mystery anymore. With the, with the first version of the stuff, you had to be careful because you had to remember what was in each slot from, you know, the generation one, the ultra on standard. On the Axe Effects 2, it doesn't do that. It tells you what's in there. And you can do it from the front of the box or you can do it in Axe Edit. Do you want to show Axe Edit just to switch the cabs? So which one do you want to hear? The, the Shiva. One with, yeah, the 12 inch. Is that right? Yep. So that was pretty much it. He switched the cab over for me. Now, I still had all the defaults loaded into that cab. doesn't change anything. It just changes which IR it points to. So let me take a look at that again here just so I can talk you through what I did. I clicked on the cab lock, and inside of the cab lock, there is a drop-down menu which lets you choose the cab you want. And there are 50 factory cabs. You can see their names listed here. And there's a sub area for user cabs, and anything that you've dragged into the Axe Effects and saved will be listed there. So the three cabs that we've just brought over, as well as those few that it detected in the other system, are there. They're green because that means we did them during the, this session. Okay, so do you want to uh, take over or do you want to direct it? Sure. Basically, all I'm going to do is just show how much an IR can change the character of it. So this is. This is one of Kevin from Onehammer. This is one of his prototypes. He's reshooting those. And if anybody's following the user IR section on the Fractal Forum, you're pretty familiar with this. It's a big running thread right now. Um, he's got new stuff coming out. There's new stuff coming from Fractal you're going to hear about later. There's, there's new, all these new cool kick butt IRs coming. And it, it's exciting to me because, like I said, I think this is the most important block in this box. Cliff's on record saying how important this is when you're running director front of house, how important this is. It's so nice to see so much attention now being paid. Remember, a lot of that stuff from Own Hammer and Redwire came down when the generation stuff was still there. This is, this is like a new generation of stuff. There's a lot of cool, cool stuff coming. I'm excited about these. I'm excited with what you're going to hear a little bit later from some of the stuff Fractal's doing and some of the artists that are going to be giving some stuff. And it's yep. off. We're going to give you all, everybody who's here at this, we're going to give you first access to some of the greatest new IRs today. It's awesome. So. 
So anyways, this is the IR that I chose that I like best with this amp the way it's set up right now. Now go ahead and can we go like to the 212 black? Uh, the, the factory 212 factory black. Factory 212 black. There you go. Just all Play along change and I'll change it while you play. Now try one of the red wire ones. This is the D or the... Now you can hear the massive difference. The big thing is if you remember how, if you remember the paradigm when you're running FRFR or direct in front of house, everything you're doing, not just the amp and the cab, you're setting the space the cab's in, you're setting the mic that's miking the cabinet, you're coming out of that into a mic pre and you're putting all that into one thing. You can run EQ after your cab if you want. You can do things you can only do in the studio and you can do that all within this paradigm that this box allows you and it's phenomenal to have that kind of control. With that control you've got to have some kind of boundaries to find your spaces. What guys will do in the studio, they'll spend all day looking for the right mic combinations, mic spacing, where to, where to mic it up, you know, what preamp to use, if there's EQ in line when you're recording it, all that stuff. We're doing that with IRs. It's the same thing. It does take the same amount of attention. It is not just plug and play. You've got to use your ears and trust them. And again, stop when you get it right, when it sounds and feels right to you. When he went through all those factory ones, they all sound good. Some sound smaller, some are tighter, some got more bass. Whatever feels right to you is what's right. We don't all like the same stuff. We can't. If we did, we wouldn't all be here. We'd all be playing the same amp, and we'd all be playing the same guitar and playing the same music. It doesn't work like that. Um, so one of the things that I like to do when, when I go through this, that's one of my favorite exercises, what we just did. And that's why I like user IRs. You can go in and mix IRs. You can get crazy with IRs. You don't really need to. If you find a good one, you just put it in your box, you go to it, and you're done. It's easy. And if you like the factory stuff, Great. If you like some of the new stuff that's coming down the pipe that's going to come up, you can just throw it into the box, set up an XY state on your cab, put one on one and sit here and go X and Y back and forth listening and playing. Or another thing you can do now is with the looper, you can throw a looper up in front of your amp, play your lick that you like for this kind of an amp, play it the way you like to play it, let it loop. You can go over here and try different stuff while it's looping and playing, and then you can check it out and dial it all in. You don't have to sit here playing and then dial in. Simplify. Use the tools. The tools are in this box. Just use them. That's yeah. pretty much it. Now, the other stuff that I was going to get into is signal routing. And I think basically when I talk about planning, the big thing with signal routing, and if you look at the factory one, this one's set up pretty much the way that a standard guitar player would think I like this one because it's easy and it's a great starting place. If you guys have seen some of the stuff that Freeman does, that Matt does for some of the advanced guys, that Sean does, where Sean, these crazy, way out of my league, way out. But you can download these. These guys do this stuff for free and share it. You can learn. I like getting some of these crazy presets and just studying what the heck they did. It's amazing to do that and it teaches you as you're going. This is stuff that you're going to be able to use on your own later on if you want to dial up your own stuff. Or you can just grab what these guys do and run with it. It's cool. And that's pretty much, that's my whole part of the show here, was just pretty much get to the basic. Unless you guys want to quickly dial up a Marshall, you want to just do that and hear it. We can Why don't I do it from here while you drive? You tell me what to do that way. Go to see JCM 800. Is it to the JCM 800 preset to Got start it, JCM, them? Yeah, just the factory one. Okay, I've never uh, pulled the preset names. It's do you know number, what number 10. Is? Number 10 it is. <coughs> Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, reverb should be okay. It'll be a little too much reverb. But the, on the cab, yes. just shortcut it, make it a high-res cab, okay. and go grab that G65. Fine. So we're going to turn the cab from a dual or stereo cab into a mono cab. I'm going to go into the users, and I'm going to choose the cab that we imported earlier. Now go to the amp block. Okay, one second. There we go. Now go to the amp this block. Is, this is fun. I need one. In. <laughs> I set on this. I'm just going to shortcut it just to hear it. On the ma I like the master at six. You turn the mic off on the cab block too. Yeah, that would be okay. good. Okay. Master, master volume at six. It's there. Six. I like uh, bass at 2.5. Two and a half. Roger. Middle at 7.5. Bring it up a little bit. 
I'm just typing in the numbers and hitting enter. Go ahead. 6.0 on the treble. About 6 on the treble. Go. No bright switch. No bright switch. Presence of 5.0. 5 on the presence. Input trim is 1.754 or something. A little boost. Yeah. And the drive. Then we're going to try the drive. Take it down to zero, so let them kind of pull it up, and then I bring the drive up. I bring it to 4.35. Go ahead. go. I'm, I'm going to bring the level up a little. Yeah, bring it up. I'm going to bring the level up a little more. And in essence, all I listen to when I listen to a JCM 800, I want to hear that. I want that pop on the cab. So I listen for those, and then I want to hear the top ringing against the middle in an even fashion. Crang! That's a Marshall JCM 800 to me. Now you can start throwing boosts in front of it. Uh, you can throw a PEQ in front of it and just boost the mids. You can grab a tube screamer, throw it in there. Anything you want to do to flavor it the way you like it, and that's pretty much it. There's your tube screamer. Oh, they're okay. <laughs> I mean, that's just a mark to me. That's my Marshall. That's what I do with it. What you do with it, you can do anything you want. You can take the kind of the, the thing, the key from it at all is take the method, use it to your advantage, find what you like, and then create it. And then you have it. Now I can take it from this room. I can go to an outdoor festival. I can go to a hole in the wall bar, wherever I want to go, praise and worship on Sunday. No problem. That core tone's there. How I adjust to the room, I usually do the sound guys. That's their job. There's a lot of guys saying, well, I got to have this and that for different rooms. Look, man, these guys got, they got all the firepower. They're going to end up telling you what you sound like anyway. If you make it sound good and you've got your own power monitor and you like the way you sound in there, you're going to play inspired. Let these guys worry about the house. And when you play direct the house, you got to trust the sound guy and you got to work with them. So don't piss them off. <laughs> Be nice. And if you're cool to them, and what I'll do is I walk in, I say, look, I'm running direct in front of house. They go, oh, no, no, you got to have SM57. I say, that's fine. I'm going to give you a feed. Just check it. I pop his SM57. I plug it into the back. I go, I got a 57 in the box in the back. It's cool. Because I do, because it's in the box. And I, play in the back. and I hit it. Usually the level's a little hot. They bring it down, and I go, just set, your, just set all your EQ you know, dead straight. Give it, give it flat. And they go, OK, next. And they go on to the keyboard player, and, they, and I'm all done. And then I get to go sit down and have a beer and get ready to play. It's a lot more fun. Not a church. <laughs> Not a church. Not a church. So can you talk about managing distortion in your, in your signal path? Because uh, on some of my patches, I get the red light coming on. No, that's a good, that's, w the key to that is when I come in, what I'll do is, is I set my preset volume on the, the level block in the amp block. As long as I do that, I'm normally never going to ever, ever, on the cleanest stuff, on the dirtiest, heaviest stuff, ever going to see that clip light go off. The We're going to do a whole presentation today on setting gonna, levels, so I'm going to do yeah, that he's, Yeah, on. and he's going to talk about it. And the other important thing is obviously getting all your levels to be equivalent in sound, and that, that's a whole different topic, and I think you're going to get into that. Yeah, I'm going to do, I'm gonna do right. a quickie on that. There you go. About, uh, and that's, that's pretty levels. much it. That's my part of the show. Cool. Any, any, questions? Other questions? any, any other questions yeah. for Scott? Any next questions? Very good. All right. Thank you very much.